that everything I say and do Can find it by my faith in you I lift up holy hands and sing Let the praises ring Let the praises ring Derek's going to use his hands and his feet right here sing so good. Hosanna, Hosanna 
God is so good. I cry out for your hand of mercy to heal me. I am weak and I need your love to free me. Oh, Lord, my rock, my strength in weakness, come rest. church I cry out I cry out for your hand of mercy to heal me I am weak and I need your love to free me oh Lord my rock my strength and weakness come rest me, oh Lord. oh Lord, you are my hope, your promise never fails me, and my desire is to follow you forever, for you are good, for you are good, for you are good to Amen. Great singing, church. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me. It's amazing. It's amazing. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call. And is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me. It's amazing. It's amazing. So amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Who am I that you are my That you hear me when I call. 
Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? It's amazing, so amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Lord, we thank you for that. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Right here, we always ask you to hug and howdy right here. Love on your neighbor.
Good morning. It is a great morning out, nicer in here. Thanks for being here. I think they've got everything fixed on the uh, electrical stuff today. And uh, if it's not one thing, it's another. Please just pray all these uh, great things that can be used in a variety of ways. But man, oh man, it seems like there's, I believe in demons, I think, because of the way that they can interfere with churches and the microphones and different things trying to uh, proclaim and get it out. Uh, you can blame Carla on this, but she gave me uh, some things about uh, uh, blonde jokes, you know, but it's blonde men jokes. And uh, used to be one, you know, the roots aren't even there anymore. But uh, this is one of my favorite. A blonde man goes to the vet with his goldfish and he says, I think it's got epilepsy. He answers, he said, uh, you know, the vet looks at him and said, well, he seems calm enough to me. And the blonde guy goes, yeah, but I haven't taken him out of the water yet. So, uh, what the, it, yeah, where's that cricket sound again? Okay. I hope you're out of the water flopping around like a good fish, you know. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to go back to this uh, passage we've been looking at for some time here in the book of Genesis chapter 19. And uh, it's not just to wear it out, but it's rather instead uh, to do is what the scriptures are given to us is to be able to take a look at what the Bible says, not only to gain the truth from it, but to gain and look and see what happened to people's lives. I think it was pretty ingenious of God to uh, write such a history book over the millenniums that uh, he would include various authors, but along with it, various people to show that uh, unlike what if I was wanting to write the book, I'd want to put in all of you and, and your perfectly good moments, not those bad moments. But God uh, didn't discriminate. He put it all in there. And um, there's a part inside that it's like, oh, I wish that really Christianity and godliness looked better than this. But but it doesn't because it's dealing with real people. And the Lord did that so that us that are real people would understand that we're not the first people on the block. That uh, one, we're not as good as we sometimes think we are. Two, that uh, along with it though, but we're not outside of the reach of God to redeem us. And that within that, that you know, the goodness comes about as we walk faithfully with him. There are, there's his part that he plays and the scriptures are full of different things like that that God does how he works in us and how salvation is something that we can have, but it should be ever increasing because Paul talked about his own and he talked about not having yet accomplished this and grown to perfection as he looked forward to what he was to become. But he didn't doubt about where he was in Christ. It was just he didn't believe he'd arrived. And I think that's so healthy. And there are even scriptures that talk about the salvation we've experienced, but the salvation we're yet to experience and along with it. And it's kind of like life itself. We can't choose much about growing older unless we decide to take our own life. Uh, we will, if we live, grow older. But uh, only you and I can make that decision to grow up, right? And as we grow older, that we grow up. And it's the same way in Christ that uh, we've been looking at Hebrews in chapter, uh, on uh, Wednesday nights and looking at the idea, though, by this time you ought to be teachers, you need to be taught the Word of God all over again. And it's not an encouraging rebuke. It's instead, it's like, hey, come on, uh, get it straight here. And it's not without love. It's instead, it's like God's given you this gift. He's planted this seed in you, but you're choosing not to allow it to grow. And so that's our choice. It's God's ability is to create in us and to cleanse us from our sins and our unrighteousness. But it's up to us to allow ourselves to grow in holiness. And this passage here, I think, reflects a man, Lot, that, uh, and again, it's not me judging him. I'm making judgments about him. But I think that he so portrays the American Christian in our world today. Uh, an individual assents and believes that there's a God, uh, wants him, wants to be saved, believes that there's probably a devil and a hell and doesn't want to go there, but at the same time, believe enough to do what with him. And Lot kind of presumed that you can do that. And yet he was drawn to the world and to the worldly life. And as a result of that, he found himself then in some precarious positions. Uh, one of the last ones leading to this point of where God, at the same time that Lot was here in this city, God is hearing things and it's building up in him. And I don't uh, understand, pretend to understand at all. But it says that he was aware of this outcry of this city, that the evil, the vile nature of it was crying out to God. And he sent the angels down to see, is it like what it sounds like it is? Uh, Abraham, the chapter before, does this bargaining with God, trying to say, but Lord, you wouldn't destroy uh, even a terrible city if there are righteous people in it, would you? And God says, well, 
And he said, well, how about, and he started off, you know, with, uh, with four or five dozen, you know, how about 40 people if they're righteous? And God goes, okay. And he kept whittling it down. And he got down to the point of 10. He said, well, if there's 10 righteous people, you surely wouldn't destroy this city. And God said, no, but there weren't. And then as we read here in chapter 19, we find out what was going on. So if you will, let's look at this, please. But first, let's pray. God and Father, um, I I always bow my head and close my eyes. And maybe it's because my mom and dad just knew that I'd get distracted if I had my eyes open. And I'm glad that, Lord, we can pray while we're driving down the road. We don't have to close our eyes. But sometimes, Lord, I think we're afraid to close our eyes because then it's just you and me. And... um, you know, sometimes, Lord, if we haven't been walking with you, that's not comfortable. But God, if we have, or if in the midst of it we're hurting, Lord, sometimes we need to close out the world and remind ourselves of the truth of your word. And God, we're thankful to be able to see, but we pray even more that we'd use our eyes to see what you want us to, but we'd also see with our hearts, see with our senses, see with, Lord, the spirit that you've given us, that we would, Lord, with holiness, see you. And Father, today I just would pray that... um, more than people seeing me, that they would not miss you. And that sometimes, Lord, hearing you is seeing you. And God, that uh, as to what the scriptures clearly show us, that you are so loving, that uh, you did not, um, God, in any way uh, seek to just destroy our lives or to give us miserable lives. But God, man, in spite of our sin, you want to redeem our lives. And Lord, you love to take that which is the most unlikely and do amazing, miraculous, godly things with. And I'm thankful to be in a group of people, God, that we haven't forgotten where we came from. And yet we're not stuck in the past. But Jesus, by your power and grace, not only forgiven, but overcoming. And that, Lord, that we could be as transformed as the Apostle Paul was. It went from killing Christians to dying to see Christians saved. And, Lord, I just would pray that you would stir within our hearts today. You'd help us to take an honest and and frank look at ourselves. And, God, that we would see what you do. But we wouldn't just see it and go, okay, yep, I'm a louse. But we'd see it and say, Lord, but you love me enough to redeem me. And we'd see that, Lord, you want to create in us a holy life. And it's not just so that we'll be good boys and girls. It's so, God, that others would believe in you. And it's so we can have a life with no regret. So help me today, Lord, with sharing this passage uh, that is not a pointed stick to try to jab people with. It's not something, God, that I've so overcome that there's no big deal to it. But, God, with each of us to recognize that there are various things in our lives, Lord, that according to your word, would keep us out of heaven. And yet, Jesus, because of you, you can overcome every single one of those if we'll but grab your hand and let you hold on to us as we hold on to you for the ride. Might we trust you today as we trusted you with giving you our soul? Might we trust you in giving you our earthly life that both of them can be redeemed by your blood, Jesus, and that you can be glorified and honored with them? So I do pray that simple prayer, God, speak through me. I don't command you, I request it. And not for my sake, but for these that would listen. And I just ask God that they would hear and know that it was you. Because there's no way I would know. And Lord, please speak to me. Even that I would continually be called unto what you want me to become. Thankful for, Lord, what's been overcome in my past. But still praying, God. Not only to not be consumed by something again. But to see now, what's the next step? Lord, that this life would be an adventure with you. One to be lived out with a smile until our last day on this earth. Bless these that are here today. Thank you for the body of Christ, God, that enhanced my life and for even those that listening in long miles away. And might we together be one in you in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how far back to go into this, so let's just go ahead and uh, pick it up here with verse 12, if you would. Genesis 19, verse 12. The two men said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, sons-in-laws or sons or daughters or anyone else in the city who belong to you? Get them out of here because we're going to destroy this place. The outcry of the Lord against his people is so great, he has sent us to destroy it. Again, God's grace, not, not, it looks like judgment and it is, but it at the same time is putting people, so to speak, out of the misery and so that it doesn't continue to enhance and to be an infection that would spread throughout. It's not unlike the different times in America and other places of the world where there have been severe diseases. And some of them have been misdiagnosed and some of them have been gone to extreme lengths to go ahead and to keep things from spreading. I remember my first church uh, 34 years ago when a lady in it that was dear soul to me, uh, Dolores, and how uh, uh, she uh, had gone through tuberculosis. 
And she had been one of those people that got isolated to keep her away so that others wouldn't be infected with the same disease that she had. And it wasn't Dolores, it was just plain Doris. But nonetheless, that she had this deal going on inside of her. And the, the alienation part that really, you know, hurts, but also the reality, this is better for me to be separated than it is to hurt those that I love. And sin can become very infectious, right? I mean, very few of us come up with sins on our own when we're by ourselves. It's usually either seeing one that somebody else had and think, I'm going to try that, or it's being with others and say, I'm going to join in with because you look like you're having so much fun. Well, within it, God sees that, and he sent, as he did in this case, he's going to bring about a destruction. He said that even though he put the rainbow in the sky, and uh, ironically, this last week on Tuesday, we had a guy driving by that snapped a picture of a rainbow over the church and uh, sent it to us. And so maybe it'll be on the cover of our church directory, plug, plug, for those of you that would get your picture taken so that we will all know each other. But uh, he took a picture of this rainbow, and the rainbow still reminds us this day of God's promise that even though he said, he didn't say, I will never destroy it again. He said, I'll never destroy it by water. And, uh, but he said, destruction is coming. And he promised it in the Old as well as in the New Testament. And so this promise of destruction, and it's because of sin growing up, just as it did back then in the days of Noah, just as it did in this located spot here in these plains of, of that Judean area, okay? So he says, you know, man, we've been sent here to destroy it. So verse 14, Lot went out and he spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place and just watch this change and see who's affected here. And that's why I'm telling you, Lot seemed to be one of these people that didn't have a lot of character, didn't have a lot of conviction. And uh, so what happens here, he says that, you know, he goes to the sons-in-law, he believed, get them out of here, as the angels had told him. And he goes to them, he said, man, hurry, we got to get out of this place because the Lord's about to destroy the city. His sons-in-law thought he was only joking. With the coming of the dawn, the angels now turned back to Lot and they urged him. So they went to them, came back, and they didn't go. And it's like Lot kind of got to thinking about the same thing. And, you know, is this real? <laughs> it looks like a perfectly normal day. And again, the scriptures and the teachings of Jesus said it'll be just like the days of Noah. It'll be just like the days of Lot. Things around don't always turn in the direction that we might think. Now, if we lived in the Mideast right now uh, or over there in the you know, areas where all this rioting is going on and you're an American, you would think it must be the second coming of Christ or surely as bad as this is. I can't imagine what that uh, diplomat went through. It breaks my heart, man, to hear some of these things going on that way. But we would think that. But just, see, just because there's some evil that's going on in one place doesn't any more mean that today is the end than it does because nothing's happening wrong in our lives and it's a beautiful day outside. God can send the storm in a hurry. And growing up in the plains of the Midwest, man, those tornadoes don't always show themselves early. Suddenly that sky can change and it's like all of a sudden you're into this storm that you didn't even think could happen on a perfectly nice day. Well, this storm is coming. God said it's urgent. Uh, in the end of the book, you know, the book of Revelation, he said, I'm coming soon. And we kind of go, yeah, you said that about 2,000 years ago, Lord, so we can relax. Your choice. Lot began to relax, and it says that now the angels come back to him and said, hey, hurry, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, you'll be swept away when the city is punished, when he hesitated. So what is it about him that didn't grasp this? I don't know. What is there about me that I don't grasp how close to death I am at any time? Why do we believe that we're invincible? And we can easily look and pick on teens because we're adults, and teens think they're, well, what do you think you are? I mean, well, we know we can get this or this or this, you know, but we can take a pill or do something and it'll cure us of it, right? We're not near as indestructible as we often think we are. And sometimes that gives us a false sense of security. But whether it's our bodies that can die or whether it's somebody out here that's evil that Satan would love to inspire to take our life or whether it's the second coming of Christ, it doesn't make any difference, folks. There's an end that's coming. And I don't think even though we hurry in our world, most of our hurrying is about what? Getting someplace. But it's not about hurrying up to get to heaven. Because when it comes to that, we're sometimes not in such a big hurry. We kind of want to drag our feet about that. And that's what they're doing here. So these angels that are urging him, come on, hurry, take your wife, get your two daughters who are here. You'll be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, these angels, man, they actually grasp his hands. This is a grown man. These are the angels God. And, and I, I know on one hand, there's this urgency factor, okay? that it's like, it's obvious to us as we read it, come on, man, get in gear. But on the other hand, don't please miss the grace of God, this tender grace that God understands. And, 
And, and I'm saying that's the part that perplexes me with God. That he, he does love, and he doesn't love me more than anybody else, more than the, the worst, vilest offender on the earth. I, I try to present myself as, as what Paul said. I'm the worst of all sinners, you know. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. Sinners like me. But, you know, sometimes we kind of begin to think, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. And that's the devil working within us. James says if you violated one of the laws, you're guilty of all of them, you know, and in danger of hell. And so this thing, though, but God's patience and his kindness sometimes leads us to relax. And, and instead of relaxing in his patience and his grace and his kindness, we have a tendency to relax what? To relax too much. And we think that means, hey, you're okay. You're one of my favorites. And so somewhere between here, it's his kindness that ought to lead us to repentance, that leads us to go ahead and look at our lives and say, man, when I did this or do this, when I participate with this, it doesn't honor my God. When I do or participate with this, it doesn't honor the people of God. When I do this or speak like that or whatever it may be, it doesn't honor the family of God or the church of God around the world. Or it hurts me as well as others with the ripple effect around. You know, that's what's vital is that we look, but I don't want to be all hellfire and brimstone about God any more than I want to be all about God's love. And even though there's some preachers that have chosen, this is the only thing they're going to present, and others that this is the primary thing, I, I truly want to balance. I, I want to balance it because both are true there. But look at these angels. Is that not cool? And they are just messengers of God. The bu book of Hebrews tells that these, these angels are wings of fire that God has sent to help us that have, will inherit salvation. And it tells us to be hospitable to all people because you never know when you're going to entertain an angel. And he's not talking about those little chubby red cheek cherubs, you know, that everybody thinks. It's like, what the crud? Whoever came up with that? You know, no, man. We're talking about mighty characters that can fold their wings in, but man, they can bring them out if they need to. We're talking about something that would be more intimidating than, than one of those big helicopters with the gunships, you know, that got, you know, the ability to fire weapons and everything that way. We're talking about angels like that. We're not talking about, but they can disguise themselves or God can place them in our lives like innocent, normal humans. I mean, that's the amazing thing. And why does God do that? To help us who will inherit salvation. God does that for us. Because he knows that we need the help. But sometimes we, we don't entertain. We aren't hospitable. Because we think, I'm down here on my own. Man, I got to bear what I got to bear. And either I'm really doing great or I don't need God or God's going to help me somehow, I guess. And we miss what he's doing to help us. But sometimes it's not like what some people believe. God helps those who help themselves. That's not a Bible verse. That's man. Now, God does help us, but man, he expects there to be something that we do on our part as well. It's the same way in a marriage. It's the same way in any good relationship. When you're just a taker, you're going to end up pretty empty. But I want us to see this thing with God and not misunderstand that it is his kindness that ought to draw us. And it is his generous uh, willingness to see our hesitation and to send people. I can be a messenger of God. Not because I'm the preacher, but... As I prayed and as I try to pray, as I prepare, and it's, it's because I don't want to get up here and just talk. I don't want to just hear myself. I, I want to speak things that God wants. It's what makes it difficult when I know there's some of you that would want me to move on. We've been here long enough, Steve. We got the idea a lot. <laughs> but there's this part inside of me that I'm not convinced. I mean, and, and I'm not talking about you haven't convinced me. I'm talking about God. And I'm talking about I'm more concerned about what he keeps putting on my plate to serve up than I am about going ahead. And it's not just warming up leftovers. But there's, there's somebody or some buddies here that haven't got the message, that haven't put two and two together and to see it's not God's all hellfire and brimstone. And come on, God, burn those people. Because some of you lack that love and that compassion. But others of you have gone to the other extreme and you think everybody that you like is going to get in just because you like them. And it's not. There is a difference and there's a dividing line about those that believe and those that really believe. And the real word for belief is trust. And it's not just, like I said, a mental ascent. James tells us what? Even the demons believe in God. Are they saved? Don't think so. But they shudder. They, they shiver and shake. But God sends people and he sends angels and he does whatever. He sent his son and he sends situations 
And I believe that he sends those things that give us chills when we know that we could have this or that and we didn't and he spared us. He gives us chills about things of, hey, I'm here even though you're not aware. And why does he do all that? Because he doesn't like us? No, because he loves us. But it's because he's wanting us to be convinced so that in our lives that we say, God, I want to turn you loose. I want to be somebody that gives others goosebumps. Not with the kind that, you know, freaks them out, but the kind that freaks them out about your presence. I want to, God, live a life that would compel my friends to go, what's changed in you? But Lot here, he's hesitating. God sees that these angels see it. They grab this grown man, and I don't know how old he is, but midlife at the very least, they grab this grown man by the hands, they look him in the eye, they grasp his hands, and then they grasp his wife and his two daughters, and he said, come on, it's no longer your turn to think, let's get out of here. I don't want to wait to that point, do you? I don't want to almost have to be taken hostage by God to move out of a bad situation. But how many of you are still dwelling in your own Sodom and Gomorrah? God's told you to leave. He's told you to get out. But because of the fact he's not sent destruction, he hadn't blown up your favorite whatever it is place that you like to dwell or gotten rid of the situation on its own, because there's a lot of us who would like God to get sin out of our life by just removing any opportunity for the temptation. And it typically doesn't. But we can remove ourselves from the place that the temptations are the strongest. We can do is what uh, I'm humbly seeing in our guys group that uh, happens. And I hear and trust and presume it's happening in the, the women's groups. Um, but when we confess sins and it's held in you know, closeness and uh, honor, but broken lives with confessions and people saying, I don't want a place to hide anymore. I don't want this in my life, I, uh, but I need to share it because I can't overcome it on my own. That's powerful. That's somebody not still dwelling. That's somebody saying, so grab me by the hands and pull me. Huh? I, I, I give you my hands. Pull me and help me to stay on track because I want to honor God with my life. I hope we have a church full of people that want to honor God. But someplace along the line, you can't just honor him by standing in that same place. You've got to take a step. These angels grabbed him by the hands and they started to lead them out. Lead them to safety. For the Lord was merciful to them. That's his grace. And as soon as they brought them out, one of them said, now flee for your lives. So they got him out of that place, out of the city. Nobody could go ahead and to drag them back and... They got them outside now, and they said, now then flee for your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you'll be swept away. It's kind of like that deal with Monopoly. What? Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Go directly to jail. Only this isn't to jail. This is get out of jail. Here's your get out of jail free card. Go, flee, run, or you'll be swept away. So it's still, they've helped. That God's done all that he can do. Now, the angels realize their other job is to bring the destruction. And so even though on one hand, what we have going on here is salvation and, and deliverance, on the other hand, the same angels are going to go ahead and bring about God's judgment. And so both things exist. Now that they've exercised and helped out with the deliverance, now it's like you go on your own. We understand that, don't we? That's what we teach our kids when you're trying to potty train them. You go now on your own. I've shown you how. You know, here's how you do it. Yes, you can use your panties, but no, it's better if you don't. It's embarrassing. Big boys don't do that. Big girls don't do that. We go through all that stuff. And you might think, how trivial. Here Steve goes back with the bathroom stuff. But let me tell you, folks, <laughs> I have come so close to trying to find one of those adult diapers and wearing it up here and say, follow me. Come on. <laughs> now, I'll just give you that picture in your mind so I don't have to do this, okay? But I believe somewhere along the line, if God could show us, I, I, I mean, today, I got a feeling there would be a lot of us pretty embarrassed if we said, God, reveal to us who the mature people are that are growing in their salvation and reveal the ones that are still wearing their spiritual diapers. Boom! Oh, I wish I could do that. I just think, <laughs> some of you would have to come to a reality and go on, yep, I'm still pooping in my own pants, you know? <laughs> Spiritually speaking, I don't want to grow up. I just kind of like this feeling. And besides, God loves me the way I am. 
Yeah, you've been a Christian for 25 years and you think he still loves you because you wear spiritual diapers? When you have the choice that you could overcome? I'm not making fun of anybody that's in a situation physically. There, there's those things that happen. I'm talking about a child that could learn but just doesn't want to because they're obstinate about it. That's what I think sometimes we are with God. We don't want to grow up. We still want to be served. We still want the world to revolve around us. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure it keeps happening that way. And God's saying, instead of the footprints in the sand, I'm going to keep carrying you. going, oh, there's butt prints in your sand because I'm going to drop you and wait till you catch up. Now, some of you say, God wouldn't do that. Okay, that's up to you. God is putting Lot and his family in a situation here where they've got the choice, okay? We got you out of Dodge. Now you go and flee to the mountains. And for some odd reason, they're still in this bargaining mindset. What part about hurry, destruction? And I guess I, I've got to believe that it's just like us with we think there'll be a second coming and when somebody's mean to us, we hope that it's going to come on them. And, you know, we've got those pictures in our mind of utter destruction and maybe we've got political figures here and abroad that we'd like to see destroyed and everything in that regard. But when it comes to the worldwide destruction that the Bible promises that's going to come with Jesus' return, we don't think it's going to happen. If we did believe it's going to happen and there's an urgency, not only would we live more holy lives, but we would do everything we can to touch others. And you tell me this last week, how many times honestly did it cross your mind about God, please lead me to somebody I don't even know to tell them about you. And God, please open up the door and an opportunity for me to share with somebody I do love and know that I don't believe knows you yet. See, when you really believe that this utter and swift destruction is coming, you look around. And you're clearly aware and you want to make sure, if you're like me at least, I want to make sure my own little tail's on the good side of things in Jesus Christ fully. And the next thing is that I want to make sure that those that I love, that they are. It's one of the reasons I'd come back to chapter 19 and preach it again. It's because one of the most haunting things for a preacher is to know or to sense that there are people in the congregation that on Sundays, yeah, but then, nah, and they never get around to it. And, but it's something that I pray about. I've got friends that I pray about and I look and I wonder, what's the thing that I could say? And it's not because I think I can save them. It's just I'm an agent of God. You're an agent of God. We should all be angels of God in the sense messengers to convey to people what's going on and who God really is. But we show it the most, I think, when we have a holiness and a kindness that was like Jesus. That was the thing. He looked so human and ordinary but every once in a while, there'd be these things that even the disciples that were with him more or less 24-7 for three years, there's these things that he would do and they'd go back and they'd go, ooh, man, he really is the son of God. And that's what people ought to see with us, that they ought to see this change taking place that we are different, not because we're saviors, but because we've been touched by the savior. They want to bargain again. They said, Lot said to them, no, my lords, please, your servant, if we found favor in your eyes, and it's like, if you found it, you don't think what he just did to you but nope, they're still bargaining. And you've shown great uh, kindness in sparing my life, but I can't flee to the mountains. A disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Look, here's a town over here near enough to run to it. It's small. Let me flee to it. It's very small, isn't it? In other words, maybe it's not as bad and, as Sodom and Gomorrah were. My, then my life will be spared. And the angel goes ahead and said, very well, I'll grant this request too, but I'll not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly because I cannot do anything to you reach it. That's why the town was called Zor. By the time they reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. The Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah and from the Lord out of the heavens. And he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and all the vegetation of the land. And then even as they're going, said, but Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. We talked a lot about that last week, that looking back thing and how many times that gets us into trouble. And she did, but it was because there was something in her that looked back and go, oh, wow. Oh, my. All that city life and it's destroyed. Now, Revelation 18 comes really close to describing something similar to that. If you will, turn over with me to it. Revelation 18. 
And here it talks about the fall of Babylon. I don't know but what America is the modern-day Babylon. I have people that, you know, go there. I've been there to Vegas, and they call it what city? It's like, hey, I'm going to Sin City. And I'm not saying poo-poo on anybody that goes to Vegas. But I'm just saying, isn't that weird? That we would go to a place that's known as that. Now, I know that there are the holier-than-thou Christians that, man, if you go, they do look down on you like, you know, you've got something wrong with you or whatever. But isn't it strange? And I know in being out there that I was over or blown away with the opulence. I mean, it's, uh, it's just phenomenal. The amount of dollars out here in the desert and nothing that has built up and risen. The, the lights at night and, man, all that glitters and one thing and all like that, it just, it just permeates that whole place. And there, there's an energy to it. And and it's almost like you don't want to go to bed. And I guess they pump in the fresh oxygen and one thing and all like that. And there's no windows, so you don't know what time of the day it is. And one thing and all but, but, you know, isn't it odd that a town would be named that? And I know people, I mean, very, 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 very seldom, and I can almost say never have I heard anybody saying, I'll never go back there again. Because anybody that's been, it's kind of like this thing of, I can't wait to go back. And I'm not here to destroy the uh, consumerism of Vegas and the, you know, all that stuff any more than I'm here just to say, but there's something about it. Others I've heard talk about New York City and, oh, it's the life and how great it is and, and the unbelievable this and this and this and the city and everything that way. And again, I'm not down on New York City. I'm just saying there are people that talk about it almost as if it was like, oh, it's like heaven. And there are other places that we can go. I mean, even people that talk about the Grand Canyon, although they talk about it, it's still not the same as the ones that talk about Vegas and New York City and all. And I'm just saying America as a whole has become the Mecca, has become the place that people in other places want to be. And they can try to create it, but man, there's nothing like America. And I'm telling you what, I think it too will be destroyed. You know why? Because the Bible says it'll all be. This small ball will all be destroyed. But I don't know, and I couldn't tell you, but what God will pick cities or the nation that we've called the United States and destroy it. Because he's got a pattern of doing that. When evil rises up to a certain extent, that he will, for the sake of many others, do it not only to cleanse the infection, but to also at the same time to be a warning for the others that will look on and go, if he'll do that there, what's he going to do to my place? Now, I mention this because here in the day and age where Christ lived and where the New Testament was written, Babylon and Rome were two places that were looked upon as being, whoa, that's where all the cool stuff is. And what we see here is the destruction. Verse eight, chapter 18, verse 1. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. This is an angel. The earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon of the great, or Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. Now, is it because she's fallen, like literally been destroyed, or is it because she's fallen morally? She's fallen instead of giving glory to God. It's Babylon that was, or at least if it's not the city, the area where King Nebuchadnezzar, that was the world power at the time, grew up in his pride and God warned him. He even did the handwriting on the wall and there were different things that took place there and he warned him, you know, and I, I take that back. The guy with the handwriting on the wall is a different one, but he warned this other guy through the dream that Daniel interpreted that, that if he didn't humble himself, that God was going to bring him down. And he, for six, seven years, whatever it was, he was humbled. His hair grew out, it said, like feathers on a bird, you know, kind of that greasy-looking starling thing. And, and he went around like a wild animal, and he ate grass like a cow. And God was using him to get the attention of that world at that time. But he was a world power, the world power. And there was a lot of stuff that took place in Babylon. The Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and Daniel stuff's all taking place there. So they, they deteriorated. Even though God, they came in and captured Jerusalem, and they took the inhabitants back with them, a lot of them back, the exiles that ended up going and living there. God put them there in this place so they could have an influence to tell them about the one God. And even in the midst of it, they didn't pay attention. So she, she continued, this city and the people that dwelled in it, continued to be selfish instead of God, uh, God-minded. So she became a home for the demons, a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. 
For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. The merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. We forget as Americans that compared to 90% of the rest of the world, we're excessive in luxury. Even the, the most humble of us in the room. We are luxurious compared to where Tara Joe is with Ghana today. Okay, then I heard another voice from him say, come out of her, my people. Do what? God speaking here. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to the heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Uh, as she has given. Pay back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. This is a messenger of God speaking about that, saying, it comes back. There's a payday coming. And again, please don't misunderstand. I'm not like into this thing of I'm going to scare the you know what out of you. No, I won't. I might capture your attention for a moment, but I'm not, that, that's not mine to do. I'm just saying these words spoken by God and given to us are for our good, for our encouragement, for our direction so that we would be people of wisdom that would look at things and go, you know what? It may not be happening right now, but it's coming. God, I want to come out. Not out of the closet, folks. Come out. Out of the sin and out of the city, out of the place where this evil dwells within and that it begins to affect you. There's choices that we've got to make along the way. It might be in our own living room. Coming out might be in our own living room and, and voiding certain things that are just easy for us to watch. It might be changing and coming out of the friendship circles that you dwell in because you can't do that and live the way that you know God wants you to live. I mean, I can't speak to every single you know, application of this, but, but I want you to see, and this is written down as a prophetic thing, not from my mouth, but from God's, and I think it's written to cities like this. And like, you know, not only Vegas and not only New York City, but Atlanta. And it doesn't mean that we have to move out of the city and get into the suburbs. It doesn't mean that we can never go down to a Braves game, you know, or Central Park or whatever the credit is, Centennial Park. It doesn't mean we can't do that. What it's doing, though, is implying and saying, can you not read the signs of the times? And can you not look at this? And do you, in participation, get more holy or less holy? And do you care? So this is being spoken of as saying, my people, come out of this. Don't share in her sins any longer because the judgment is building up. Verse 7 again, give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen, I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine, she'll be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. And I'm not saying it's like we've got to get out of Atlanta because there's going to be to doom and, and terror wreaked down on every city that's above so many people. It's just that we need to recognize wherever we're at and look at, you know, what is it we need to come out from to be holy? When is the last time you did your word study on holiness? Where you went through and you looked at every passage that dealt with holiness. We used to sing at the church where I grew up. Holy, holy, holy is the... Lord God Almighty. You've heard it and maybe know it, but when you sing it, do you sing it because you like it and you're familiar with it? Is it just because God's holy or do we realize that his holiness is infectious and he wants us to be infected with it? And holiness has every picture of the same thing of Lot and his family out of God's grace being delivered before the destruction. Our holiness toward God is not only honoring to him, but it's for our good. It's our protection. Our holiness helps others, but it's healthy for us, and we breathe a different air, and we have a life that is lived with a purpose instead of just live to keep up with or to do whatever everybody else is doing. There's judgment that's coming. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they'll weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they'll stand far off and cry, Whoa, whoa, great city, oh Babylon, city of power, in one hour your doom has come. I um, don't mean to be in the least bit insensitive, but when those twin towers, that my understanding at least is that some of it, and it's not just because of that, but were affected, the, the towers that represented kind of the financial world, when the planes hit them and they were destroyed, there were tears that not only obviously rang out with the people that were there, but 
even people here in Atlanta and on the West Coast and around the world, oh, did people think that Armageddon was maybe coming? Yeah. Cried out to God, prayed for themselves, prayed, we prayed for them. It's terrible. Terroristic powers. 3,000 some people died. This is talking about massive destruction. And yet, it wasn't because of the lost lives. In this particular case, it was because of the events that took place. City life has something where you can do and you can hide in it. It's the nightlife. And Jesus said, people that do good do it in the day. They don't go out at night. Because that's when the darkness works. And in our own lives. I mean, I'm not here to judge you. I want you to judge yourself. I want you to ask God and say, God, as you look at my life, I mean... How's my holy factor going? But not only is he holy, but we're supposed to be holy because he is, because now he stepped into our souls. That's why this is called his temple, our body. But Babylon here, you know, when she was destroyed, it talks about not only the people that weren't destroyed in the midst of it, but the ones that had gone there before and they heard about it, or as it's showing here, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore, cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet cloth and every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made from ivory and costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense and myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and and carriages and bodies and souls of men what was that last one and the bodies and the souls of men were traded golly is that haunting two thousand years ago it's today we give up our souls for the stuff and then when it's destroyed we're like lot's wife we look back and go oh no never i don't because i think secretly she hoped okay we'll leave for a little bit and then we'll go back when the coast is clear it was completely annihilated, desecrated, gone, wiped off the face of the earth. And God says that's what's going to happen. And with it will be people caught up in it. And it can be righteous people caught up in it if we're in the midst of it. And I'm not saying that we can flee from all evil or that somehow or another that we can go out and follow me and I'll lead you out to the promised land in West Central Illinois and we can build our commune and we're going to live peaceful and godly lives. No. I just want to make sure if we're living in the midst of it that we can still be holy because that's how powerful our God is. But we've also got to know our own limits to the point that what can you handle? Not, not what can everybody else handle, but what can you handle? What handles you? When do you trade your soul? And what is it you'll trade it for? A moment of satisfaction, a moment of, or the long-term moment of honoring God. I don't know why it makes being a godly Christian person sound so boring. I've got 34 years with no regret other than my own sin. I have no regret of being in the ministry, but I regret my own sin as a minister, as a Christian. And not taking the holiness thing farther, you know? Because I look back and it's like, why? Why am I so dense? Why did I keep wanting to wear the diapers? Why don't I want to grow up? And in that same way, I want you to know too that there's nothing wrong with the Christian life and there's nothing boring about the Christian life. And it's not like if you live the Christian life, you'll never have any more fun. Man, in the last week, I've talked to I don't know how many different people that talked about, talk about looking back and longing two years ago when we're in the midst of reconstructing this whole building and spending late hours and getting off of the regular job. Some of them, the people started at five or six o'clock in the morning and coming here and working till 11 or midnight at night and calling that the good old days and how good it was and how wished others could have joined in because there was something about sweating and working together to accomplish a project. This building was turned around in three months, completely redone in three months time, impossible except with the hand of God. But was it boring? No. Was it always fun? No. Was it delightful up in the attic, you know, rapid insulation when the ceiling up there, you know, the roof was 100 degrees? No. But now that it's pumping out cool air, it's like, cool. And now that you see it come together, what a package. 
But, you know, it didn't happen because God just went ahead and we prayed and said, God, transform. It happened because God used people. Now, he's not concerned about us building buildings. He's concerned about us building temples, the lives of people. He's concerned about our souls being cleansed so we can give people a good idea of what a clean heart looks like. And he's concerned with us beginning to enjoy his favor and not the favor of the world or the flavor of the weak. And so it's all about that. It's that holiness that he's, he's speaking to the soul that he created that his thumbprints are still on when he knit us together in our mother's womb. He's talking to that part and said, come on, you belong to me. Come back to me. And we go, sorry, God, I'm having such a good time over here. Don't take me away from that. Don't destroy my city. Don't destroy my life. And I'm saying if they put off one of these E-bombs that would cripple Atlanta and most of the metropolitan areas they've designed them you know the kind that can go ahead and be set off that will travel through and destroy every metal conduit every little copper wire you talk about grinding this city to a halt we suddenly would have no running water at all other than what's in your toilet tank and what you might be able to get out of the pipes in your home that's it because everything's computerized including our water You'd have no electricity because not only is the wire destroyed, but there's no power plants that would be able to dodge it either. You'd have no running water, no power, and you'd not have the ability to go out and put gas in a tank, whether it's your car or a container. And besides that, your car won't work because even the throttle anymore in these cars and the steering wheel is drive by wire. It's not direct like it used to be on the old time stuff. Then what? And, and I'm not trying to intimidate or put fear into you i'm just saying would we then cease to exist or would we find out what real life's about it's only 50 or 60 years ago that running water really was a luxury in this country because most people had to go outside to the outhouse now that'd be a reason to want to wear diapers not grow up right because who wants to go out there especially when it's cold out you know but and spiders and everything and it's like oh and the smell but it was a reality of life. Closets, man, there was no such thing as a master closet. I mean, I remember mom and dad's bedroom, they had maybe had a three-foot closet in it. And you went back to houses that were older than it, and there were no closets because there weren't enough clothes. You just had a wardrobe, you know, because you had your two everyday clothes. You had your Sunday go-to-meeting clothes. That was it. The whole family could put it in a wardrobe. But we're not rich. Yeah, just keep telling yourself that. That's what the devil wants us to believe. But I'm fearful in my life. It's easy to look back and it's easy to go back and mourn for all those things. But did you see that last part? And the bodies and the souls of men. They'll say the fruit that you long for is gone from you. All your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They'll weep and they'll mourn. And I go, whoa, whoa, great city dressed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. And then it goes on from there. And it's just basically talking about all that people either got out of it because of the fun or because of the wealth that they were able to go ahead and buy and sell and trade. And what does it say in chapter 13 of this book? That in the world that's coming, that what, to be able to buy and sell and trade, you've got to have what? The mark of the beast. And it's only the people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life that won't get that mark. And do you see how we've been marketed how we're appealed to and we've got all these things that we believe we've got to have or we've not arrived? How many of you got, okay, how many of you actually did get the iPhone 5? I'm not saying that makes you bad, but did, were you at the front of the line? Oh, come on, now this many people, somebody had to have one. Huh? You did, Lindsay? No. no. <laughs> somebody had to have, yeah. And I'm just saying, because I wanted one. I found my plan wouldn't give me the discount. And I'm like, well, I've been a loyal customer. That's just the way business life is, folks. Loyalty has nothing to do with it, does it? And so we pay to the insurance company, and we pay to this, and we pay to that. Do they care? No, they don't. But we've got to have it. And, and, and again, I'm not crucifying any of you. I'm just saying, wow, I look at my life, and oh, are we consumer-oriented would I care enough that if I were given the choice of to get the next thing, I have to have this mark or on my hand or forehead or both? Or if I don't, 
To stand with God, then I've got to give up the stuff? Would I? I want to tell you I'm convicted. I believe, yes, I would. And I don't just preach this for you. I preach it to me to bolster my resolve because I believe that the devil is that deceptive that we will sell our souls out. Shoot. How many of you honestly have sold yourself out for not the mark, but just for a good time? And, and I'm not talking about me judging you. I'm just saying can, I can look back at my life and see times. I didn't stand up and say, God, I'm leaving you because I'm going to go have some fun. I just tried to ignore God to join in the fun. It's selling out. And so as you look to this, I think it's vital and man, again, I'm out of time, and I already went past, and, and some of you tell me, don't apologize. I'm not apologizing. I'm just saying I recognize, but, but tell me today that you get it. Tell me today that there's been change. Tell me today holiness is all about you, Jesus, that I want more of it. Tell me today that hey, I look at the world, and I'm really leery now in my life, and I'm going to do things to, you know, to to be unhitched from all the stuff that holds me down. That I, I would, before I open an email, I'm going to open God's book in the morning. Oh, whoa, now I know that would be a test. Before I open Facebook, I'm going to go to his book. And some people live on Facebook, right? I don't think they ever log out. Uh, does that mean they've got the mark of the beast? No, I'm just saying we are so addicted to all kinds of things that really we're not really addicted to God. And the funny thing is, and if I had more time, I'd just read right on through 19 and 20 and 21 and 22 of the book of Revelation because it goes from that point on into talking about God's city, which ironically, really, if you look through the symbolism and I'm not saying that God doesn't have a heavenly city. I'm just saying, here's the reality, folks. When he calls a temple a temple, what's he talking about in the New Testament? Your soul and mine. He's not talking about a building. He's not talking about a church building. He's not talking about Jerusalem and the temple. Those were physical things that he gives a picture of saying, that's what I want to hear. When he's talking about the new Jerusalem, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about the souls and the hearts of believers that our streets are paved with gold. Peter talks about the gold and he says, your faith of greater value than gold but is purified by the fire. You see God reaching out and he's saying, no, you don't understand it. I'm not impressed with the car you drive, the house you live in. I'm impressed with the place you give me to stay. And have you given me a room? And is it a guest room or have you given me the whole place? How much room have we given God to dwell in? How much of us is really devoted to letting this be the new Jerusalem? Because you see, it calls it a bride beautifully dressed, which is always symbolic in the scriptures, always pointing to the church. That's what we're to be giving him, not a church building, a temple, our lives. That's why it says, flee from sexual immorality. All of the sins a man commits are outside of his body, but he who sins sexually sins against himself. This goes on in the next chapter, it says, or two chapters later, it says, uh, avoid sexual, or not sexual, avoid the uh, idolatry because it's the worship of stuff instead of the worship of God. And he says and he speaks that to us because he wants us to be free and he's not barking at us and telling us to be holy. It's saying, man, for your own good, don't you want to be holy? Let me dwell in you and you'll become holy. Not if you just give him the bathroom to dwell in. Not if you just give him the closet to stay in. And you know, even if you throw out one of the blow up mattresses, here you go, Jesus. I want you in my heart, but this is all I'm going to give you because I'm staying in the master suite. And that's what it really is, folks. It's a changing that around. But here's the key as Henry comes up. In 21, it says, he said to me, it is done, verse 6. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I'll give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God. He'll be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, murderers, sexually immoral, those that practice magic arts, the idolaters, and, and then 
I love this because people champion so much in talking about the sins that are really bad. After talking about all those, he said, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. He goes from there to talk about the holy city. And what's amazing is Lot was told to get out of the city, but we're told in the New Testament to come into the city. And we're also told that nobody that's impure or unholy can enter it. So God's appeal to us is to let him. It's not that you and I can suddenly become holy on our own, but it's one of those things we can't do without him and he can't make us holy without us joining with him. That's the partnership that happens. And so today, if you've never accepted Christ, why not? Why not begin that walk? And if you've accepted him, but man, you're ready to go ahead and say, God, I want to grow up. I don't want to be a 25-year-old Christian still wearing my spiritual diapers. I want to grow up, God. With your help, let me grow. If today you recognize there's something in your life that, man, where holiness has not been a part of it, then confess it to him and grab a friend and say, please, please, please pray with me and hold me accountable. Invite that. Don't, I don't need anybody coming up to me or to anybody else going, I'm going to be your accountability part. No. You invite people to hold you accountable. You don't go tell them. But man, if you want to do it, it's going to take it, right? Just like overcoming any addiction, folks, it's going to take help from others as well as a resolve in your own mind. But the cool thing is you've got God on your side to do it because he designed us to be holy. And Jesus died for us to become holy. Would you stand and respond as he leads, please?